welcome everyone. Uh, as Ashu said, I'm a shareholder at Berman Fink Van Horn. We're located here in uh, Buckhead. For those of you who came in person, I uh, really appreciate it. Uh, we have another 30 or so folks uh, watching online. And so I will try to do my best to uh, look at the camera a little bit and not forget about those folks, um, but also address the folks in the room. So as Ashu said, I'm going to talk about uh, employer non-competes and other restrictive covenants, trends, traps, and hot topics. Um, you know, this, uh, there is so much going on in this arena right now. Uh, I'm going to really be racing through to get done in an hour. So I'm going to do my best. Uh, if I'm flying through the slides, I'll be happy to stay afterwards and answer your questions. For those online, happy to uh, answer anything by email or feel free to give me a call. Um, this really is an area, uh, it's funny, Ashu is reading my bio and, uh, you know, I, I'm both uh, someone who's involved in business and employment litigation, uh, but it's really uh, the intersection of employment and intellectual property law in a lot of ways. And so I'm very involved at the national level at the AIPLA uh, Trade Secrets Committee and also, as Ashu mentioned, with the Sedona Conference because trade secrets are really a hot topic right now. I'll talk more about it in a minute, but when the Federal Defend Trade Secrets Act was passed in 2016, sort of created the fourth leg of the stool for uh, federal uh, intellectual property protection and put trade secrets on a par with patents, trademarks, copyrights, uh, the more traditional uh, federal, uh, trade, uh, the federal intellectual property protections. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about first is uh, state and federal legislation. As uh, Ashu mentioned, I am going to talk about Georgia law, but what's going on in this arena nationally is, I think, really important for you to know, uh, for you and your companies. Uh, if you have operations outside of Georgia um, and even within Georgia, uh, this is really a, a hot topic that uh, there are a lot of state legislatures that are looking at this. Congress is looking at it, and it's something that uh, you need to be aware of. I will also talk about some recent developments uh, under the Georgia Restrictive Covenants Act that was passed uh, back in 2011. Talk a little bit about no poach agreements, which uh, aren't uh, directly non-competes or restrictive covenants, but very often arise out of uh, the resolution of restrictive covenant or trade secret litigation. And then relatedly, I'll talk about computer fraud and abuse and some of the developments in that area, as well as uh, in the trade secret uh, arena. So let's uh, jump right in on the legislation. So uh, there's been uh, significant concern, um, both at the state and federal level, about uh, really the abuse of non-competes, uh, or the perceived abuse of non-competes. Um, you may have seen in the news a number of years ago where uh, Jimmy John's, for example, had uh, everybody who worked for Jimmy John's, whether you were making sandwiches or uh, doing the stock in the back, you had to sign a non-compete that said uh, that you would not work for another sandwich shop within a five-mile radius or three-mile radius, whatever it was, not only of the Jimmy John's that you worked at, but any Jimmy John's anywhere in the country. So if you worked at Jimmy John's in Chicago, and then you, know, you went to college in Alabama, and there's a Jimmy John's down the street, you can't go work at the subway next door. Um, and you know, that kind of abuse is what's led, in my opinion, to uh, all of the activity in this arena and what's going on uh, at the state and federal level. So at, at the federal level, there's uh, been several proposed bills in Congress. I'll talk about those. Um, and interestingly, and something that is somewhat unique these days, uh, there seems to be bipartisan support for some kind of reform to rein in the use of non-competes. Um, and really, as uh, I'm not going to get into a uh, civics lecture, but you know, with the states being the laboratories for uh, legislation and, and government uh, intervention in business, there have been a, a flurry of state laws that I'll talk about uh, some of them in, in depth. Uh, but at the, at the federal level, uh, some of this started with uh, President Obama in 2016. There was actually an executive order that he issued in um, April of 2016 that was based on a Treasury report, uh, which was titled Non-Compete Contracts, Economic Effects, and Policy Implications, uh, which decried the perceived suppression of wage growth and brain drain of skilled workers in states that strictly enforce non-competes. And so the executive order that he issued directed all executive branches and departments and agencies to identify specific actions uh, to encourage competition within the U.S. economy and report that to the National Economic Council. Um, he then followed that up in October of 2016 with a call to action where he encouraged states to move toward non-compete reform. 
and laid out what uh, his administration saw as some of the best practices in that regard. And interestingly, uh, with the change in the administration, this didn't slow down. Um, under the Trump administration, uh, the FTC held full-day workshops on non-competes in January of 2020. Uh, and um, those are, uh, are continuing. There's new ones that are actually coming up, I think, uh, this week or next at the FTC. Uh, and then uh, President Biden uh, then issued a, an executive order on non-competes uh, in uh, this, this past year in July, um, and basically calling on the FTC to utilize its statutory rulemaking authority, and this is really important, to either ban or limit the use of non-competes altogether. Uh, so if you look at, at uh, President Biden's, uh, some of his campaign um, materials, there was information in there about the possibility of banning the use of non-competes, like in California, and uh, he's carried that through with the administration. And I think there have been a lot of other priorities in Washington, and this hasn't been one of them, uh, but it's certainly something that needs to be on your radar, particularly if you're a company uh, that regularly uses non-competes as a way to protect your business. Um, the FTC in November uh, of this year just recently issued a strategic plan for its fiscal years 2022 to 2026, and that included express references to non-competes and what the FTC intends to do. Now, again, like I said, there have been, there have been several bills introduced in Congress with bipartisan support. Uh, going back to 2015, there was the MOVE Act that was introduced, uh, 2018 and 19, the Workforce Mobility Act uh, and the Freedom to Compete Act. And then most recently, in this year, the Workforce Mobility Act, again, of, of 2021, was, was reintroduced with some changes. I'm not going to go into all the details because these have just, uh, are just our bills that have been introduced and have not uh, obviously been passed. Uh, but it, what it shows is there is significant interest in this issue in Washington, uh, in my opinion, in large part, uh, because, you know, industry is not regulating itself, right? What we see time and time again is the government gets involved when there are issues that uh, are perceived to be uh, abuses by business, and that seems to be what's going on here. Um, now, another one in the March, March of 2019, there were six U.S. senators who requested the Government Accountability Office to investigate the, use of non, the impact of non-competes on workers and the U.S. economy. And uh, in that, they cited three ways in which uh, they contended non-competes were being abused. The excessive imposition of non-competes on low-wage workers, like I was just talking about, Jimmy John's being the best example. Uh, the inability of workers to engage in genuine negotiation over these agreements. And the belief that most working under a non-compete were not even asked to sign one until after either receiving a job offer or actually after starting with a company. Um, and so they asked the GAO to investigate questions like what is known about the prevalence of non-competes in particular fields, including low-wage occupations, um, what's known about the effects of non-competes on the workforce and the economy, and what steps uh, have uh, states taken to limit the use of uh, these agreements, and what's known about the effect that those actions have had on employer, employers and employees. Now, as I alluded to, the President Obama's call, Obama's call to action resulted in an increase in legislation covering non-compete agreements. Um, and you know, one of the most significant trends, not surprisingly, is the prohibition against the use of non-competes against low-wage employees. Um, but also there are things like uh, providing uh, notice to employees against whom a non-compete will be enforced, uh, either before employment uh, or before the person is asked to sign it. Um, but then there seems to be a recognition that other types of restrictive covenants like uh, non-solicit of customers, uh, invention assignments, non-disclosures, that those types of restrictions are most almost always reasonable and appropriate. It's more a focus on general non-competes. So here's uh, just a quick list of some of the recent uh, states that have uh, passed laws limiting the use of non-competes. Um, and uh, I'm going to try to run through a few of them uh, quickly because I think it's, it'll help you understand some of the issues that are being addressed and some of the concerns that, uh, at least at this stage, state legislatures seem to be addressing. Um, the first, as I said, is the focus on low-wage workers. If you look at the, the recent statutes, everybody's got a different definition of what low wage is, um, but that, that seems to be a, a fairly significant focus of the legislation.
Massachusetts to me is the most interesting and the most uh, telling in terms of how big an issue this has become. Massachusetts historically had been the type of state that had uh, allowed, the court, uh, allowed businesses to use and the courts vigorously enforced uh, non-competes. And uh, I have a good friend, uh, Russell Beck, who is one of the uh, uh, top non-compete trade secret lawyers in the country. Uh, Russell was intimately involved in the legislative process there. And uh, you know, when Massachusetts passed a law of putting significant restrictions on non-competes, I think to me that signaled that this is serious, this is real. Uh, if a state like Massachusetts is going to drastically change its law, uh, then there's something to this. So I think just looking at some of the components, first it limits it the maximum duration of non-competes to one year. Uh, it pro prohibits enforcement against non-exempt employees um, or employees who are terminated without cause or laid off. That's another trend that we're starting to see is someone, if, they're, if their employment is terminated involuntarily without cause, uh, whether a non-compete, they should be subject to a non-compete. Um, continued employment is uh, no longer sufficient consideration uh, for a non-compete entered into after the commencement of employment. That's another area where uh, the legislatures are looking at the idea of someone's been working for a company for some period of time and they're suddenly asked to sign an agreement, uh, whether that's reasonable or appropriate. And this is another one, uh, the, the garden leave provision, which states that during the period of no, of no competition, the employee must be paid at least 50% of his or her highest annualized base salary in the two years preceding termination or some other mutually agreed upon consideration. And so that's a, a little bit of another trend over in Europe that's very common and something we're starting to see more. Um, as I said, there, in, in Massachusetts, non-competes are only enforceable if the restriction is for one year or less post-employment, um, unless, and this I think was partly Russell's idea, was this springing non-compete idea. The idea that if someone behaves badly, they steal information, they breach their fiduciary duty, they solicit customers when they're not supposed to, then uh, the court can, uh, it can be allowed to impose a non-compete for a longer period of time. Um, but in Massachusetts, the, the non-compete will be presumed reasonable in scope if it's limited to the geographic area in which the employee provided services or had a material influence, presence or influence within the last two years. What's important there is that's focused on the employee, right? And we'll talk about the Georgia statute in a few minutes. Our statute says that it's anywhere where the employer does business. Uh, Massachusetts has pulled that back, um, and that's sort of what the old law was in Georgia, that the territory had to be restricted to the area where the employee worked for or represented the employer. Um, and then also, as in many states, now in Massachusetts, the non-compete has to li be limited to the specific types of services the employee provided during the last two years of employment. Um, Washington's uh, statute, um, again, a prohibition uh, on the use of non-competes uh, w with lower wage workers. Uh, duration can't exceed more than 18 months. A similar garden leave type provision like what Massachusetts has. Um, and the other thing I maybe wasn't on the slide but uh, I think is in Washington and also it's true in Massachusetts. Again, in order for a non-compete to be enforceable, it has to be part of the offer before someone comes to work and it has to be provided a certain number of days uh, in advance. So it can't be sprung on an employee at the time they, uh, on the first day of work or you know, at some point after they start working. Um, and then in Washington, like in Massachusetts now, a non-compete entered into after the start of employment must be supported by independent consideration, not just continued employment. Uh, Maryland statute, recent statute, again, uh, uh, addresses low wage worker. Uh, and uh, in Maryland, the uh, non-competes can only be applied and enforced against those employees who provide unique services or to prevent the future misuse of trade secrets, routes or lists of clients, or the solicitation of customers. Uh, John Tanner and I were talking a little bit earlier about you know, trade secrets and the protection of trade secrets. Um, you know, at, to what extent in Maryland you now have to prove that someone had access to information that was truly a trade secret in order to enforce a non-compete. It'll be fleshed out by the courts, but that certainly seems to be the intent of the statute. Um, Maine, New Hampshire, and Rhode Island, we group these together. 
Again, uh, there, it addresses the lower wage workers, uh, but also uh, there are enhanced notice requirements. Main employers have to disclose the non-compete uh, prior to an offer of employment and provide a copy at least three days before the employee is required to sign the agreement. Um, and I can tell you, I mean, th these are real world situations. I've had people call and say, hey, you know, I just moved to Atlanta from Chicago. I sold my house. I moved my family. I had this offer from this company. They never said anything about a non-compete. I showed up on day one and they're asking me to sign this non-compete. Uh, you know, what do, what do I do? And, uh, you know, that just in terms of best practices, uh, that's just not uh, really a good practice for any company. And now we're starting to see that there are states that are legislating against that type of practice. Um, all three in Maine, New Hampshire, and Rhode Island uh, exempt non-solicitation of customers, invention assignment, non-disclosure agreements, et cetera, from their, their coverage. Now, Washington, D.C. Is, is a little bit odd, and I won't spend a lot of time on it. It's, uh, non, Washington, D.C. is essentially a complete, a complete ban on non-competes. Um, now, it's not yet effective, uh, or it may have become effective and then became ineffective. It's a little unclear. I've never really followed how uh, sort of um, uh, legislation works in Washington, D.C., uh, but because it's not a state and because it's related to the federal government, it is uh, very unusual. Um, but this Non-Compete Act was passed in, uh, and signed by the mayor into law on January 11th of 2020, 2021 uh, and was, became effective actually on March 16th of 2021. But it's tied to the budget and uh, it wasn't necessarily approved in the budget. And then there were concerns that were expressed uh, about the scope of it. Uh, for example, it did away with essentially the duty of loyalty. Uh, it did away with any, any provision that would prohibit an employee from engaging in competitive employment during employment with the current employer and things of that nature just went you know, way overboard. Um, but the implementation or the effective date uh, basically has been now been postponed to April 1st of 2022. And there have been some amendments that have been, uh, uh, that have been introduced uh, that will hopefully you know, pull that back sort of from the brink of being what I consider to be just way over the top in terms of any kind of uh, reform as it relates to uh, employees in Washington. That said, if you have folks in Washington, D.C., you need to keep an eye on this uh, because it applies to anybody that, uh, that works there. Um, now, Illinois is another one. I put that in the category of Massachusetts. Illinois was a state where non-competes were fairly regularly enforced uh, by the courts. Um, and uh, they've got a new statute that will apply to agreements entered into on or after January 1st of next year. Uh, again, there's a restriction on the use of non-competes for lower wage folks. Um, and there's even a restriction on the use of non-solicitation of customer provisions uh, for anybody earning under $45,000 a year. Now, those minimums increase every year uh, or every five years, uh, but uh, that's what they've got for now. Um, but again, where Illinois goes a little bit further than maybe Massachusetts is there's this uh, prohibition on the enforcement of a non-compete or a non-solicitation covenant with any employee terminated, furloughed, or laid off as a result of business circumstances that are similar to the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, it also restricts the use of non-competes with individuals covered by a collective bargaining agreement. Um, and prohibits non-competes in certain uh, industries with respect to certain workers. So those are just a few of the highlights of ones that have passed. There's pending legislation. Um, there's, I think this was as of a few days ago. It probably has changed since then. There were 26 bills uh, in nine different states uh, that were pending. Uh, we've had a couple introduced here in Georgia that don't seem to have gotten any traction, but uh, they're not currently pending because our General Assembly is not in session, but um, it's certainly something to keep an eye on. So now let me talk about uh, the Georgia Restrictive Covenant Act. Um, this was originally signed into law in April of 2009. Um, you may re recall that in 2010, on the, uh, the ballot, there was a referendum about uh, the, the judicial hostility to non-competes was rooted in the Georgia Constitution. The only way that the legislature could address the issue was by changing the Constitution. It had to be a constitutional amendment. It had to have a referendum that everybody voted on. 
And the way it was worded, it sort of was worded to get a yes vote, uh, which it did. Uh, and uh, the, so the constitutional amendment went into effect. Uh, the problem was the way they had set it up was the statute was supposed to automatically go into effect once the amendment was passed. Um, but there was a problem with that under the Georgia Constitution, so they had to uh, reenact the law in May of 2011. So for, we're getting pretty far afield this, at this point, but for most uh, purposes, any agreement entered into uh, after May of 2011 is governed by the not-so-new law. Um, one of the things that, that I think is important to talk about is uh, to whom does it apply? It starts with the definition of uh, that the provision is applicable to these types of contracts. And I'm going to focus primarily on employers and employees, um, but it does apply in these other situations. And as I've been talking about, in these other states, you have this concern about the types of employees against whom non-competes are being enforced. And the proponents of the bill in Georgia, you know, one of the, the selling points was, we're going to outlaw non-competes for a lot of workers. And we're going to limit the use of non-competes to only certain folks. Now, that may have been the intent. And uh, Kevin Levitas was uh, one of the state representatives who uh, was one of the primary proponents of the bill and, and a sponsor of the bill. Um, Kevin's a neighbor of mine. I've become friends with him. I make fun of him all the time of all the holes and all the problems with our statute. Um, but, you know, that was one of the things that he really focused on. He said, look, we're going to eliminate non-competes for a wide swath of the workforce. Um, that may have been great in, in theory. It really hasn't applied in practice, in my view. Um, but the statute does say that non-competes, as, as, again, as distinct from customer non-solicits and other restrictive covenants, shall not be permitted against any employee who does not do one of the following. Uh, customarily and regularly solicit customers or prospective customers. Customarily and regularly engage in making sales or obtaining orders or contracts. Um, or perform the following duties, basically uh, managing a part of the enterprise, uh, customarily and regularly directing the work of two or more folks and having the authority to hire and fire. Now, those are fairly limited. The problem is when you get into these definitions, particularly the de definition of key employee, um, it's a fairly expansive definition that uh, has led uh, many companies to sort of take the position that anybody that has access to confidential information, anybody that uh, has uh, customer contact is, uh, is covered. Um, so I'm going to go through a few of the cases. It took a long while from 2011, really until 2018, for us to start getting some decisions from the appellate courts in Georgia uh, to give us some interpretation of some of this language in the statute. And I realize that a hairdresser is probably not particularly relevant to most of your businesses, but I think what it tells us about how the courts are looking at these definitions is important. Um, so in this case, uh, you had a hairdresser in Virginia Highlands. She had a three-mile non-compete. Uh, she also had a non-solicit with respect to customers with whom she had contact or learned of during her employment, and an employee non-solicit. Uh, and she resigned and opened her own salon 2.1 miles away. And you know, there's a lot of things in this decision you can look at and say it, it sort of helps understand where the court, why the court did what it did. Um, she announced her resignation via social media by posting a picture of her workstation at her old uh, at, at the old salon, not at her new salon. Um, she also tagged the shave, which was her old employer, in her post, and therefore it, it, it appeared on their social media accounts. Um, and she also reposted pictures taken of her customers at her former employer and, uh, and tagged those as well. So the trial court found that the, uh, the covenants were reasonable and enjoined her from basically owning or operating a salon within the three miles, uh, prohibiting her from interfering with or soliciting or attempting to solicit any customer or potential customer um, with whom she had contact, and also prohibiting her essentially from recruiting or soliciting uh, employees of the company. Now, like what I was saying, one of the key issues is who can be covered by the statute. What she tried to argue on appeal was she was not the type employee against whom a non-compete could be permitted. Uh, but the court found that she was um, because, one, she expressly agreed in her agreement uh, to customarily and regularly solicit customers and potential customers. Um, and she also had direct 
extensive contact with customers and customarily and regularly solicited them on behalf of the company. So, you know, looking at it, that's really what the courts are looking at within those definitions. Now, Blair versus Pantera Enterprises, that's a case from 2019. Um, this gentleman was a backhoe operator, and God bless the lawyer who went in to get an injunction against the backhoe operator. Uh, I see John is, uh, is cringing, um, but they did. And the trial court enjoined this backhoe operator uh, from working for a competitor. Um, now, he worked on rail railways owned by Norfolk Southern. Um, he actually had a, he, he supervised, he had a truck driver that was assigned to him who would, you know, pull his backhoe around uh, to the places it needed to be. And so he, technically he supervised that individual. Uh, but he didn't have the ability to hire or fire anybody. He didn't regularly direct the work of anybody other than his truck driver. He was never asked to make any sales to Norfolk Southern or any other customer. He never had any customer lists. Um, he never made a sales pitch to Norfolk Southern about who it should use. He didn't negotiate the contracts with them. Um, and most importantly, in my opinion, he was earning $13 an hour. So the, the non-compete that he signed prohibited him from operating a backhoe on any railways owned or leased by North, Norfolk Southern in its Georgia division. So he leaves to join a competitor. And as a result of his leaving, he must have been a really good backhoe operator, Norfolk Southern redirected its track maintenance business uh, to his new employer. Um, the uh, former employer, as I said, filed a lawsuit and sought an injunction, and uh, that injunction was granted. Uh, so the employee appealed, and basically what the Court of Appeals said is, look, to interpret the statute to include this in individual would create the un unintended restriction on trade and run counter to the balance the legislature sought to create by limiting the application of the act. And it said the phrase key employee is not intended to include every employee. Uh, basically that the legislature's intent would be frustrated if this person was considered a key employee under the definition. And in my opinion, they sort of bent over backwards to uh, uh, interpret the definitions in a way uh, that led to this result. Um, now, while the employee was Norfolk Southern's preferred backhoe, uh, because of his positive attitude, reliability, and proficiency, he actually gained his good reputation due to his own work ethic uh, and personal attributes, not by reason of uh, his former employer's investment of time, training, money, trust, exposure to the public, et cetera. Now, you could probably argue that about every employee, that uh, customers like certain employees because of their uh, attitude, their reliability, and their proficiency, and so how you could ever distinguish between is that the reason the customer likes this individual or is it because of what this individual has been taught or learned from by his employer uh, is, uh, in, at least in my mind, a very hard line to draw. Uh, but in any event, the, uh, the trial court was reversed and the uh, Court of Appeals uh, lifted the injunction. Um, so the, one of the other issues with the Georgia statute is the question of, of territory. The, the statute has all these definitions in it about what type of territory is, that whether a territory needs to be included or not, and if so, uh, what territory is permissible. So this case from the carpet care case from 2018 uh, addressed that issue. You had an independent contractor who had a one-year covenant, and that covenant prohibited the contractor providing, from providing any service to any customer with whom he had contact during the term of his relationship with the company. But there was no geographic limit. Uh, so essentially what this was was a customer-based non-compete. Um, the employee argued that it was unenforceable because it had no geographic limit, and the trial court agreed. Now the Court of Appeal Appeals affirmed that. The problem is it was a two-to-one decision, and I'll talk about that in a minute. That leaves us with a little bit of uncertainty as to whether that's binding precedent. Um, but first, the majority relies on 13853A, which provides that enforcement of contracts that restrict competition during the term of a covenant are, reasonable, uh, are, are enforceable as long as they're reasonable in time, geographic area, and scope of prohibited activities. So basically what the Court of Appeals said is that that means that a non-compete has to have a geographic limitation. Uh, in that case, the parties actually didn't dispute that that covenant was, in fact, a non-compete rather than a customer non-solicit. Uh, so Carpet Care says, well, the statute, um, the requirement of a geographic limit shouldn't be read literally. Uh, 
narrowly limiting the covenant to only the customers with whom the contractor dealt met the reasonableness requirements of the statute. Uh, but the majority said that would ignore the plain language. Now, Judge Ray, who has since uh, been appointed to the federal bench and is now uh, in the Northern District of Georgia in the federal court, um, you know, he, he disagreed and he vigorously entered a, uh, penned a, a vigorous dissent uh, said the statute doesn't require a geographic limit. It only requires that any geographic limit that is placed on it be reasonable. And the company here could have drafted it more broadly to prohibit any competition, uh, and it didn't. So uh, he didn't think this was a reasonable outcome. Uh, as I said, it was a two to one decision. So the precedential value is questionable. Um, the court also did not address the, the question of whether the covenant could be saved by blue penciling uh, when there was no territory at all. Uh, they applied for cert and cert was denied, so uh, the Supreme Court decided this was not worthy of attention. So one of the other things I want to talk about is with the Georgia statute, the idea of just having a non-solicit under, under the old Georgia law that existed before the statute. You could have a customer non-solicit that was limited to customers with whom the employee had contact, and as long as the, um, it was uh, affirmative solicitation on the part of the employee, in that context, uh, the court said you did not have to have a geographic restriction or the other uh, components necessary to have an enforceable non-compete. Uh, the, the statute carried that common law rule through, basically repeated it almost verbatim from the cases. The difference is that uh, the definition of material contact, under the old law, it had to be actual contact between the employee and the customer. Under the statute, it is expanded to not only actual contact, but also if it's contact with, if it's customers, that the employee supervised people who had contact with those customers, or customers about whom the employee obtained confidential information, or if the person basically was get, receiving compensation as a result of sales to those customers. So the definition of material contact was significantly expanded. Um, the the Pedowitz uh, case is a case that I think is important. It's getting a little bit old now, but uh, it was a, in that case, Judge Vining found that a non-solicitation provision was unenforceable because it prohibited the defendant from soliciting business from any customer or prospective customer. It didn't limit it to those with whom he, had material, he or she had material contact. So one of the issues that comes up, and um, I know Ashu mentioned my uh, podcast that I'm on, but we have a blog, uh, our firm does. Uh, we've got some really interesting blog articles on this around the country about what is solicitation. Um, sometimes I hear clients talk about, well, it's, it's a wedding invitation, it's not a solicitation, right? This is, it's just, I'm sorry, it's a, it's an engagement announcement, not a wedding invitation. All I did was I sent out uh, uh, an announcement saying that I'm now uh, at company B when I used to be at company A. And the question is, does that constitute solicitation? Um, there's not a ton of great case law in Georgia on that issue, but uh, there's a bunch of cases in Florida and California uh, about what actually constitutes solicitation. Certainly, if it's a wedding invitation, you're inviting someone to call you uh, if you're their insurance broker and you're inviting them to call you to uh, talk about your insurance needs, that's likely to be found uh, to be a solicitation. But a simple announcement saying, hey, I'm now with XYZ Company, it may not. Going back to the, the shave barber case with the, the hairstylist, um, you know, she did a lot of things. I pointed some of them out earlier that led to the result against her. Uh, but she had used social media uh, during her employment to solicit customers. And so when she opened her own salon, her posts were targeted toward informing her former clients that she was opening a new salon. In one post, she implored existing clients to refer new clients in exchange for discounts. And the court found that messaging be of that nature went beyond uh, a mere general announcement. Um, one of the things I've seen, for example, is you know, when you, when you switch companies uh, and you change your employer on LinkedIn, for example, um, generally there's going to be a, 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 an announcement that's going to go out to everybody you're connected with on LinkedIn that you've, you're now with XYZ Company. Now, you can turn that off, uh, but the default is that that announcement is going to go to out, out to everybody in your network. Um, there's actually a financial services firm that, um, uh, it's a national firm, 
And they have in their restrictive covenant agreement where they say that if you do that, we consider that to be a solicitation. And uh, we're going to sue you soliciting for soliciting all of your clients uh, if you're connected to your clients on LinkedIn or other social media. Now, I haven't seen that provision actually challenged as to whether a court has found that, well, just because they say it in the agreement, it's actually a solicitation. Uh, but that's the kind of thing to look out for. Uh, in your agreements, um, you know, what is it that you consider to constitute solicitation? I've seen some that are really well drafted that sort of explain the types of things that at least the company considers to be solicitation. And then there's others that just say you can't solicit without any additional uh, color, and that can leave that to the interpretation of a particular court. Uh, so I want to talk about non-recruitment covenants. Uh, this was a little bit of an issue under the Georgia statute. There was uh, some question about whether employee uh, non-solicits, employee non-recruits were covered by the statute. Uh, I always thought based on this definition of restrictive covenant uh, being an agreement between two or more parties that exist to protect the first party or party's interest in, and this list of things including employees, meant that employee restrictive covenants are covered. And ultimately, um, the Court of Appeals agreed uh, in uh, 2020 in the Belt Power case. Uh, but before that, there were some trial court decisions that actually went the other way. Um, and the problem is, and again, this is one that I make fun of Kevin for, you've got this uh, provision that applies to, to restrictive covenants relating to employee recruitment and solicitation. But then you have nothing in the statute that tells us what the parameters are for an enforceable covenant of that nature. Um, it's not like the non-solicitation provision where you have a specific provision of the statute that says, well, here's how you can draft an enforceable non-solicitation covenant. It's not like a non-compete where you have to have a geography and all of that. And so there's, in my opinion, an open question about what's required to have an enforceable non-recruitment covenant. Um, now, Judge Davis uh, in the, uh, our new Georgia statewide business court um, has issued the uh, decision in the Cameron Martin versus Hauser case. It's a real interesting decision if anybody has any, any interest in looking it up. Hauser was a insurance brokerage that uh, uh, the, the principal was caught up in the um, Varsity Blues scandal, uh, and there were people that were leaving there saying that their reputations had been injured uh, by virtue of that and they needed to move on. Um, and just as an aside, uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with the Georgia Statewide Business Court, I'd in encourage you to get familiar with it. Uh, Judge Davis is fantastic. I think um, uh, Lynette Jimenez, his staff attorney, may be watching online, uh, but I, I would put in a plug for the court. Um, right now, there's a little bit of a problem because it requires two-party consent, uh, which I don't think was the original intent, and they're trying to get that fixed. Um, but it is a great place, particularly for this type of litigation, uh, a judge who is uh, uh, attentive and has uh, dealt with these kind of complex uh, employment and business issues. Uh, and in, in reading his decision in this case, I think it, it really provides a lot of insight into how he looks at these issues. Um, you know, ultimately, in that case, he found that the lack of a geographic restriction was in fatal to enforcement of the uh, non-recruitment covenant. Uh, because it applied to all company employees, agents, representatives, associates, et cetera, wherever they were in the world, and regardless of whether that individual ever had any contact with those people, uh, and regardless of what they did for the company, uh, whether they, uh, and whether they had terminated their, uh, their employment with the company. And so basically, there, there were a lot of other reasons that, that go into it, but these are some of the highlights. And basically what the, uh, Judge Davis said is, look, I can't rewrite this covenant for you. Um, the, the blue penciling may, it wouldn't, wouldn't save it, and therefore he uh, struck it down in its entirety. Just real quick on, uh, on defenses under our statute, the one I think I, is worth highlighting is the economic hardship defense, and I think that does go to this low-wage worker issue we've been talking a little bit about. Uh, but it's not limited to low-wage workers. It, it says if the imposition of the non-compete uh, will result in an economic hardship. The court can consider that. It's not a complete defense. Um, contrast that with Florida's law, where Florida's law says the court cannot consider the economic uh, situation or any economic hardship that may result to the employee against whom the non-compete is being enforced. 
so talk a little bit about blue penciling and modification. Um, for those of you who aren't all that familiar with this area of the law, really what we do is uh, sort of in the, on the academic side, we talk about two different types of states, right? There's, well, there's three. There's, there's the states that won't blue pencil or modify at all, like uh, Georgia used to be. Uh, but for those that do, there's states that will blue pencil, which means that they will strike out offensive portions of the agreement and enforce the rest. And there's other states that uh, do what's called judicial modification, where basically the judge can completely rewrite the agreement based on what he, believe, he or she believes is, is reasonable uh, under the circumstances based on all of the evidence that's been presented. So the question is, in Georgia, are we a blue pencil state or a judicial modification state? Once again, the legislature didn't give us a ton of guidance here. Um, here's the definition of, of modification that I've got here on the slide. Um, and uh, Judge Thrash in 2016 issued the Lifebright decision. Basically what he said is, you know, whether the question is whether modify means the court may only excise the offending language or whether the courts are empowered to actually reform and rewrite the covenant. Clearly, the former is permitted under the statute, but the latter is an issue of first impression in Georgia. And, you know, he takes the General Assembly to task a little bit here and says the statute's of little help and provides little guidance on whether the courts have the ability to insert language to render the covenant enforceable. So what he does is he looks to the pre-2011 law on sale of business. And sale of business cases, even before the statute, uh, the courts had held that, uh, that they could blue pencil an overbroad restricted covenant. But they said the blue pencil strikes, but it doesn't write. Um, and so Judge Thrash finds that there's nothing in the statute that makes it clear the legislature meant to change that. Uh, and so he decided that uh, the blue penciling approach rather than judicial modification approach is the uh, correct approach under the statute. Basically, he found that the term modify in the statute means the blue pencil approach that the Georgia Supreme Court had taken in the Hammer case, which was a pre-2011 sale of business court case. Uh, and so he found that courts may strike unreasonable restrictions and may narrow overbroad territorial designations, but can't completely rewrite and reform the contract by supplying new material terms. So the, the critical thing there is that in that case, there was no uh, territory. And what Judge Thrash found was he couldn't write in a territory to make the covenant enforceable. And I don't necessarily agree with his reasoning in its entirety, but I agree with the result. I think that ultimately the statute only, for, only allows the courts to blue pencil, not to judicially modify. So, um, I mentioned earlier uh, that I'll talk a little bit about no poach agreements. This is a, a real hot issue right now, uh, particularly at the Department of Justice. Um, and uh, you know, basically this is, uh, there, it started with a lot of the tech companies out in Silicon Valley that had reached agreements not to uh, recruit uh, each other's employees. Uh, and so there uh, has been a lot of scrutiny in this area and the, the real serious concern is not only the civil liability but the potential criminal liability of entering into these types of agreements. Um, in October of 2016, the FTC issued guidance announcing stronger penalties for employers using no poach agreements. Um, and in January of 2018, the Attorney General in Washington, uh, Bob Ferguson, opened an investigation uh, and uh, that has led to significant enforcement action by other states. Uh, I've got a list of them here and uh, I realize I'm going to really be running short on time so I'm not going to uh, go through the, all of this in great detail. I just think it's something that's uh, important to be aware of uh, to the extent that your, your companies have any agreements with other competitors uh, to uh, not recruit or not hire uh, each other's employees uh, for whatever reason. It's something that uh, really can lead to serious consequences with the Department of Justice and the FTC and also to a uh, uh, ton of uh, civil litigation. Um, this year the DOJ has really ramped up its enforcement action uh, a lot of these are in the franchise context where uh, franchisees have agreed not to hire each other's employees, uh, but uh, it, has, it has occurred in many other contexts, including healthcare and others. So uh, I'm going to talk just briefly about the Georgia Trade Secrets Act and uh, talk about some trends in trade secret law. Uh, one of the big issues that comes up is inevitable disclosure. The idea that if uh, someone uh, possesses trade secrets of an employer, uh, 
uh, can the court enjoin that person without a non-compete, enjoin that person from working for a competitor in a particular capacity under the theory that that person's uh, employment will inevitably result in them disclose, using or disclosing trade secrets. Started uh, with a decision out of the Seventh Circuit uh, in uh, Pepsi, a guy had left. He was the head of marketing for one of their divisions. He left to go to, I think it was Quaker Oats or somebody that had a competitive uh, uh, division. And um, you know, he engaged in a lot of bad conduct on the way uh, out the door, stole a lot of information, was dishonest about things. And the court found that even without a non-compete, he should not be permitted to work for the new employer because that would result in him inevitably disclosing trade secrets. It's a doctrine that is really disfavored uh, by most courts around the country, but there are some states where uh, it has been adopted. Uh, here, the last uh, statement on this issue by the Georgia Supreme Court was in 2013. In that case, the, the trial court had issued an injunction against uh, Mr. Holton on the grounds that he would inevitably disclose uh, trade secrets at his new employer. And uh, the Georgia Supreme Court reversed and say, said the inevitable disclosure doctrine is not an independent claim under which the trial court can enjoin an employee from working for an employer. Um, the Georgia Supreme Court did leave the door open for the possibility in the right case for the inevitable disclosure doctrine to be adopted in Georgia. I think uh, you know, there's an open question about what that case might be and what it might look like. Um, but another significant issue in Georgia and in many other states is preemption. Uh, under the Georgia Trade Secrets Act, uh, it supersedes all uh, remedies for misappropriation of trade secrets, and that includes information that doesn't rise to the level of a trade secret. So if someone steals confidential information, um, your remedy is if the information is a trade secret, you can sue under the Trade Secrets Act, but you can't bring a claim for breach of fiduciary duty because they stole the information while they worked for you. You can't bring a claim for civil for conversion, which is essentially the civil cause of action for theft. Uh, you can't assert a claim for um, uh, unjust enrichment or something of that nature. Um, but it does not affect contractual duties or remedies. So if you have, for example, a confidentiality agreement uh, or non-disclosure agreement with that employee, you can uh, certainly sue for breach of that, that agreement. Another uh, trend, and, and the Sedona Conference that I mentioned is accelerating this trend around the country, is the early identification of trade secrets. And really, this is a, 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 the slide here is about the California statute that actually exists on this issue. And basically, what this statute says and what courts are starting to say around the country is that uh, because of the sensitive nature of discovery in trade secrets cases, that a plaintiff has to identify very specifically what it is it claims its trade secrets are before it can even conduct discovery uh, from the defendant. Because a lot of times what you see is, right, a company files a trade secrets case, whether they have a good faith basis for doing that or not, and they just say, like, everything this person ever had access to is a trade secret. Um, and it's almost impossible for the defendant to understand what information the plaintiff really considers to be a trade secret and is really at issue in the case in a way that will allow that defendant to frame discovery and uh, engage in meaningful discovery to understand the nature of the claims against the individual. And so the courts, um, the federal courts in particular, have been real active in this area. I filed two of these motions. Filed one uh, two weeks ago, I'm filing another this week um, in cases where I'm defending trade secrets claims to say, look, the plaintiff has to identify with some particularity what it is they say is a trade secret. It can't be the entire software program because the entire software program, the customers all see the front end of the program, right? They're, if they're saying something in the program is a trade secret, they have to identify that. Uh, and the courts have been real receptive. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the Defend Trade Secrets Act from 2016 um, was uh, federalized uh, trade secret law. Uh, one of the things I like about this statute is it allows me to get into federal court uh, when I'm bringing or even defending a trade secrets claim if they've brought a DTSA claim. I'd much rather be in federal court in these cases in most instances. I find that you know, people just behave themselves a little bit better in federal court for some reason, but also the, you know, around the country and um, you know, to some extent in Georgia, the, the quality of the judiciary, particularly when you're dealing with issues like this, uh, is you're much more likely to get judges who, who have dealt with these cases before, know, at least have some understanding of the law, um, 
and uh, you know, know what an injunction is, know how to hold an injunction hearing, when to hold it, why these are important, why they need to move quickly. Um, but uh, the, the DTSA amended the Economic Espionage Act, so there was a federal statute but, uh, that addressed trade secret theft but it, was only, it could only be enforced by the Department of Justice. And what the DTSA did was created a, a private right of action for federal trade secret uh, misappropriation. Now the DTSA is modeled on the UTSA, uh, but it's not identical. Um, importantly, DTSA does not preempt, so unlike the Georgia Trade Secrets Act, it does not. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about the ex parte seizure. The, the available remedies are typical in terms of uh, trade secret statutes, injunctions, damages, attorney's fees. Uh, there's a three-year statute of limitations. Um, but one of the key points of the act is the ex parte seizure provision. And this was based on the Lanham Act. If anybody's familiar with the Lanham Act, um, you have these ex parte seizure provisions. So if someone is selling counterfeit t-shirts outside of a concert venue, uh, the owner of the, the trademark can go into court on an ex parte basis, get an order allowing uh, the federal marshal to go out and seize those t-shirts because they're counterfeit. In that context, it certainly makes sense, right? The worst case scenario is it turns out that they, they weren't counterfeit. Uh, the person who was the uh, owner or seller of the t-shirts can be compensated for their loss. In the trade secrets context, think about it. If you hire somebody at your company and unbeknownst to you, they bring some information from their former employer, and that a former employer contends that information is a trade secret and goes in on an ex parte basis and gets an injunction from a court that says, the federal marshal can come out to your place of business, seize your servers, seize your computers, because that information may reside on your computers. So this was a really controversial provision when the statute was being debated in Congress. Um, through the AIPLA Trade Secrets Committee, we had an opportunity to comment on it, um, and there really was a, a lot of concern about this provision. But ultimately, it, it made it into the statute, and the statute says it should be only granted in extraordinary circumstances, and the reality is that's how it's played out. Uh, I think there are very, very few cases around the country where federal judges have been willing to, on an ex parte basis, issue a seizure order that would allow someone to come in. Uh, like that and seize the information from a company. Um, the uh, Senate Judiciary Committee hearings identified inevitable disclosure as a concern, uh, particularly uh, uh, the senators from California were very concerned about that. Uh, California is real big on employee mobility. Um, and uh, basically it was initially addressed by a provision that stated an injunction could not prevent a person from accepting an offer of employment under conditions that avoid actual or threatened misappropriation. Um, but it was, the, the statute was further amended to provide that an injunction may not prevent a person from entering into an employment relationship and that conditions placed on such employment shall be based on evidence of threatened misappropriation and not merely on the information that a person knows. In other words, there has to be some evidence they actually took something, not just something that's in their head. Um, so I'll just talk briefly about confidential information. Under the old law in Georgia, it was really important to understand the distinction between what information you consider to be confident, merely confidential versus what information you consider to be a trade secret. And while that distinction is still you know, somewhat important, uh, the statute has made it less important because the, the statute basically says that a non-disclosure covenant can extend um, to uh, you know, as long as the information remains confidential, it's not subject to, that, that the modification is allowed. Um, it has this definition of confidential information, which basically is any kind of business information. Um, it does have some exclusions as to the types of things that cannot constitute confidential information. Um, and um, basically, you know, as long as the information remains confidential, it's protected by the, by the statute as long as you have an agreement. So with the few minutes I have left, let me just check my time here. Um, I think I've got about five minutes left. I want to talk about computer fraud and abuse. And what's important here is we had sort of two uh, statutory frameworks, much like the trade secrets now. You had the Federal Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, and then we have the Georgia Computer Systems Protection Act. Um, the federal statute really was an anti-hacking statute. That was what it, it, its purpose was, and that was how it was intended provided criminal penalties for intentionally accessing a computer without authorization, 
or exceeding authorized access and obtaining information. Um, the, uh, it, it's, it's a criminal statute, but it also provided for a private right of action and for civil uh, remedies. Uh, but one of the keys under the statute was there was really no definition of without authorization uh, or with authorization in the statute. And you had this part about exceeding authorized access. And it said to access a computer with authorization and to use such access to obtain or alter information in, in the computer that the accessor is not entitled so to obtain or alter. And so uh, just uh, this last year, the uh, U.S. Supreme Court weighed in on this issue. There was a split in the circuits. So, for example, here in the 11th Circuit, uh, there was a, uh, a decision that essentially said you could use this statute against an employee who took information uh, from your computer systems for uh, an improper purpose, to take it with him or her when she le they left, or uh, to a competitor. Uh, the Ninth Circuit and the Second Circuit and some others have said, no, 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 that's not what the statute intended. If the person actually was authorized to access the information and did something improper with it, that's not what the statute says. And so it was actually a case uh, here uh, out of Georgia that went up. Um, a Georgia police sergeant uh, looked up a license plate in the police database for a friend and he was convicted under the CFA of exceeding his authorized access to the information. The 11th Circuit, because of this prior Rodriguez case, which involved an IRS officer doing something similar, uh, affirmed, but the Supreme Court reversed in a six to three decision basically saying that if the person is authorized to access the information in the first instance, then they can't be liable for breaching, uh, for, for violating the statute if they do something improper with the information. Now. If you have a database or databases within your company that someone is not authorized to access and they get themselves into that database and then take information, then the statute very likely still does apply in that context. Uh, but it does not apply essentially to the disloyal employee who's just uh, stealing information from your computers. Um, now in Georgia, uh, unlike many states, and I'm really surprised at how few states have statutes like this, um, we have our own Georgia Computer Systems Protection Act, um, and some of the language is similar. You have this without authority. Um, and again, this is a criminal statute, but there are, uh, it allows for a civil cause of action. Uh, and there's multiple decisions from the appellate courts in Georgia that says that the statute does apply in the employer-employee context, uh, both civil and criminal cases. Um, and so the definition in Georgia is that without authority includes the use of a computer or computer network in a manner that exceeds any right or permission granted by the owner of the computer or computer network. So it is a little bit different than the CFAA language. Um, and in the Ducom versus State, that was actually a criminal case. The Court of Appeals rejected the argument that um, she copied the uh, homeowner association data with authority and in the course of her legitimate job uh, duties and that the evidence supported the jury's finding that she had acted without authority under the Georgia Computer Systems Protection Act. So I think I've made it in just under the wire. Um, I don't know, Ashu, if we have time for questions. Uh, I don't know if there have been any that have been submitted online, but if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to answer one or two. Or I think we do have time for questions, so welcome. And then I don't know how you can check to see if anybody submitted online. Um, Jill, Jill's shaking her head, so we have no questions online. Yeah, I've got a question to start with. So interesting that you ended with the Georgia Computer Theft Act. I've actually used that when I was in private practice doing litigation um, to um, you know, claim an embezzlement case. So it wasn't just about taking data or confidential information, but it was actually a person using the company's computer system mm -hmm. to steal money. Um, and we were able to prevail under those. That's great. I hadn't thought about that, but you're right. I mean, it certainly, if someone uses a computer to redirect funds or whatever, that, that very well falls within the definitions uh, of the statute. So the question I have is about no poaching agreements. That's something new to me and was interesting that it can come with criminal and civil liability, so that's rather scary. Um, in terms of what is considered competitor there, what about like two sister companies? that are very much competitive against each other in the same market, but they're owned by the same 
enterprise, that those would not fit into, if they prohibit each other from taking I would not think so. Um, the only reason I would hesitate is because of these franchise cases. Uh, but in the franchise context, I believe you know, you're talking about multiple owners, right? You're not talking about one owner of all of the franchises. So I think it is different. Uh, but I, I wouldn't want to you know, have you uh, make any decisions based on that. It would be something I would want to look into. But I, I believe that if it, the company is, or that the companies are owned by the same owners, that that should not apply. So the question is uh, whether the um, uh, requirement for additional consideration beyond continued employment is something that uh, is being codified more and more by the state legislatures or whether it's still something that's just a matter of common law. And I think what we're seeing is that many of these statutes, that is something that is, is being addressed. So North Carolina, for example, you have to have con uh, more than just continued employment, but that's based on you know, case law. Um, and I think in many states that have that sort of rule, it's been historically based on, on cases. Uh, but uh, what we're seeing, like you said, in Illinois and Massachusetts and others, that is one of the issues that the state legislatures are addressing when they're uh, engaging in, quote, non-compete reform. Um, and so I think it is something you have to look at on a state-by-state -state basis. Most states, I think the, the saving grace is that it appears that most states are, like Georgia did, are saying this applies for agreements from the statute enactment moving forward or some date in the future moving forward, not to agreements that were entered into previously. So, you know, as long as you know what the, the, the status of the law is on the day that the agreement's signed, that's really all you need to know. And Georgia, would you say, is pretty, um, that continued employment is the basis of sufficient consideration generally? It is, yeah. Even under the old common law, which was pretty hostile to enforcement or restrictive covenants, it was, and the statute didn't address that or change it. So, yes, continued employment in Georgia is sufficient. So the question is, uh, with the no poach issue, if you're settling litigation over uh, restrictive covenants or non-compete viol alleged violations, uh, can the settlement agreement essentially include a, a stand down or an agreement between the two companies not to uh, recruit or hire each other's people for some period of time? And, and my understanding is that's an open question. One, it happens a lot, right? Um, you've just given an example. I mean, it, it is something that is very often part of the settlement of those, those cases, particularly when you're talking about bigger companies with groups of employees that have moved. Um, I suspect that the Department of Justice might look at it differently and the FTC might look at it differently, that even in the context of, of settlement of a lawsuit or a group of lawsuits, it's still not permissible. So uh, I think it's, I haven't yet seen a case where that has been prosecuted or where it's been litigated, but I think it's coming. And I would not agree to that, so I, I was the guy. Yeah, and, and I've been on both sides of that, and uh, you know, I, I just had that argument recently and tried to tell the other lawyer that I could not counsel my client to enter into that, and he insisted that his antitrust folks had looked at it and there was no problem with it. So you know, it's a good lawyer and a good law firm, and I didn't have any reason to believe that he was you know, just snowing me. I think that um, you know, reasonable minds can differ on whether that is an antitrust violation. I think if the Biden administration has its way, um, you know, there will be regulations that you know, could, get, um, uh, could get written that might address this and make it clearer that that does constitute a violation.